So I'd like to uh, I'd like to welcome everybody from perhaps around the world. Uh, I saw people from as far away as Australia. Uh, we should give a prize as always to the person who comes the furthest distance, but in virtual time, that's, uh, that's up to Mitch to determine <laughs> how long it gets. But I have old friends. I have current teachers. I have part of my design team supposedly coming in. We're going to have a rich, rich time, and I can't wait. So I would just, uh, we, we called this stories to calm students, and then we added teachers and parents because the stories, as you'll see, go home and we've got turbulent times. So I just want to get some agreement on where we're going today and then uh, proceed. So I always call these things changing the story together because the dominant narrative of fear and conflict is broken and stories help us come together. But I want to start uh, shortly with a meditative moment because everything starts with us and within us. Then we'll look at the background of how these stories, these stories came into being, why stories and these stories in particular and then uh, what we've suddenly found after Carrie and many of the others have diligently for the past two years and some longer gotten them into their classroom routine and everything else so all of a sudden the door is shut and we're all trying to be creative and seeing how these move home and so we'll be talking about transitioning from school-based to which it extended generally to the family but now specifically in these times how do you move that to home base and what is the impact of it so uh, how and, th and then everybody not doesn't have to wait to the end this is a beautiful thing that Mitch has created and uh, you know you can jump right in as if we're in a room together so I think that's really cool so without further ado, if everybody's happy with those points, and if you're not, you can shout a few more out as we, as we proceed. But I want to start to what I call meditative moments, uh, opening our, overcoming our fears, turning up the light. I used light in this whole sense of stories to light our way, and the whole sense that even kids, as kids are used to this light and darkness. Everything started with, not started, but from Star Wars with lightsabers and the dark side. And so when we talk about turning up the light to get through the darkness, it's something we're used to. So first I want to talk about putting on our masks because when we were able to fly, if you remember, the announcement comes up, if the plane loses altitude, oxygen masks will drop. First put yours on before supporting those near you. And so let's look at what kind of mask we have within us that, that protects us and let us go into the light. I always think that when people talk about their fears, we're looking at what's happening externally and reacting to it. Yet within us, let's walk into that pillar and huge lamp of light that's within everyone, within everything. Go sit at its feet, embrace it, be washed over with light. Let it wash away the fear, let it wash away the anxiety. Let it wash away our basic weaknesses that block us from being our full light carrying selves. And then pull our children, our family, and everyone in around us because the light is infinite. Just breathe in that light and let go of the fears, let go of the anger. 
and then open our eyes and embrace everyone around us and spread that light as you always do. And I can't thank you enough for joining me on this journey because we're all fellow travelers on this journey of life. And so many of you have been with me and supported me and we're gonna have a great time going forward. Okay. Ralph, I, I have to say that you certainly know how to reset a mood. I think um, for me, and I'm hoping for everybody else, it's like things were so hectic and just the way you did that um, transformed me into being much more open. So thank you. Well, that's all God's grace. And uh, thanks, everybody. Everybody's, again, it's all inside. And it's just that we were so focused on everything outside and then the waves and the turmoil and everything builds up and, and I got, you know, there's stories in each separate, in each tradition that root off this, but when we're in a, a universal setting, sometimes I just, light is nothing more universal. Okay, folks, thanks, Mitch. So, why stories? <laughs> why stories? Well, for me, the modern world has lost its stories. And, you know, without stories, children lose that arc around which they can wrap their identity formation. They lose their moral compass. We lose a sense of what, what I call a visible standard in society. Uh, and, and so uh, what we're left with is all the physical material stuff, which, uh, you know, doesn't really help us in, in terms of how we grow outside of wealth and the inequities as opposed to understanding who we really are, what our being is. And then I go beyond that and say, without uh, a shared narrative or shared narrative, we are moral fiber. You know, the, the stories are the fiber of our cultural fabric of our, and, and they, without the stories, those, the warp and the weft of the loom, it all starts to fray. And those, so our sense of fairness of right and wrong of truth, if I might say, gets eroded. And, and so even people who may not, uh, look to these things uh, are, are you might normally feel, but everybody is in it together. We can't have a democracy without an ethos, a shared narrative. We're not educating citizens. We're educating consumers and an electorate. We're taught who to vote for and what to buy. So the stories that touch our souls and, and get us through give us a different view. So every story has a background let's see what this guy is so you know for me it's all a matter of helping children reconnect to their voice as opposed to having to hear all the noise that's being given them and i i like to say when i if i'm in a classroom and i think carrie's heard me and, and dan johnson when he arrives has heard me is that i'll ask kids do you know what virtual reality is? And they, they see this old guy with a turban walk in and not sure how he's going to connect. And suddenly I ask about virtual reality. And boy, they're with me and they start shouting out who their avatars or whatever they, and what they do and what games they play and everything else. And boy, they could go on all day if I don't say, okay. And I say, that's fine. But honestly, what? we see out there in the world the injustice the poverty the disrespect for women and others from all that is virtual reality that's all man-made and you are the avatars you kids are the avatars who were born to change that reality and story is the tool that and that you're gonna have so if you don't like the story you're hearing and it doesn't make sense, it's probably because it's not your story. So our job as adults and as teachers, and we're all teachers in one way or another, is to help kids find their story and then nurture them to go and support them as they change the narrative in the world. Now, 
all stories have a beginning and my story here grew out of a situation which Bob Hansen knows well and supported me, which is following September 11th, our spiritual center called Govan Southern USA North of Syracuse was a victim of an arson attack. Four kids got drunk, thought because of the media hype that our turbans showed that we were, meant that we were supporters of bin Laden and decided to torch the place as a patriotic duty. But what did we do out of our tradition, Guru Nanak and Babaji's teachings, we went public with a very powerful statement of forgiveness, which galvanized the entire com broader community. At a time of hatred, this message of forgiveness was bringing everybody together. And even when the kids were at their hearing, teens heard the forgiveness and it transformed this child's life. It transformed all their lives. But what happened is the boys, when they were in jail, wrote to us, if only we'd known your story. If only we'd known your story, we never would have done this. And isn't that true in today's world that we're so divided because we can't share each other's stories anymore? And so out of this came this challenge to say, okay, let me take traditional stories from all over the world, both sacred and secular, and build them into curriculum so that they can be integrated into school to deal with what today is what state and standards are calling a multicultural uh, platform, which in fact covers both social, emotional, and academic learning. And so that's after we recorded them with music and sound effects for which we won a Parents' Choice Award, which was nice. We then built that model and for those of you, I know that I don't know how many people are on now, Mitch. I can only see, you know, uh, you know, a bunch. But so we probably have around 18 people on. Okay. So I don't know how many people are familiar with uh, Castle's breakdown of social emotional learning worldwide, but it seems to be spreading all over the world in this concept of social emotional learning. Can we get some sense of hand raises or anything if, if people are familiar with Castle Circle and, and stuff? Right, I, th I think you, you, you all have the ability to click on raise hand um, if you are familiar with, with Castle. Um, so I'm kind of looking and I'm not seeing raised hands here. So okay. I'm going to guess that at least half the people are not familiar with Castle. Okay. So what, have you heard the term social emotional learning, even if you haven't heard of Castle? So I'm going to assume that everybody has heard of the term or understands the term social emotional learning, but okay. given that, I would still say you have a unique way of getting the full power of social emotional learning through. So you should, I'd love to hear it from you. <laughs> Thanks, Mitch. So, so basically there, there are uh, different ways to uh, get at the inner self and what drives our inner self, especially in, uh, in education and corporations in, in whether it was called the whole person approach or whatever years ago, there was a sense of emotional intelligence by Daniel Coleman. Has everybody heard of um, the concept of emotional intelligence? That's a corporate buzzword for sure. It was then picked up by what became the collaborative of academic and social emotional learning, say this emotional intelligence concept ought to be integrated into education. And so this is the classic wheel of the, the 
collaborative came up with to identify what they called the five competencies of social emotional learning. They're pretty straightforward if you look about it. I mean, you got self awareness. Do we understand what our emotions and feelings and, and other stuff that, that either drives us in a good direction or messes up our life one way or another? And then how do we manage it? Once we, we're aware of it, then how do we manage it? Are we uh, good at understanding social situations, be it from a classroom to a home environment to a community or a nation environment? What are those relationship skills that we need to develop? And are we going to be, and by the way, there's an ethical in front of responsible. So you can be responsible at decision making, but you're not necessarily going to be ethical about it. And so there is an ethical, responsible decision making in this. So these are what are called the five competencies of social emotional learning. And as curriculum spread across the world, this is it. And, and what does this have to do with stories? Well, what it has to do with stories is that we are, when you take a story and we go over here moving what I call moving from theory to practice, the question is, how do you integrate this whole concept, which is becoming a learning standard across this country and across much of the world? But how do you easily simply integrate it so a kid can internalize the message and we as a society can share it? And so it's almost like stories are out there, but how do they fit? The arrow is going this way, meaning moving from theory to practice. Actually, stories have it all, and, and you got these different ways of explaining it. But right now, social emotional learning is a man, at least in this country and moving across the world, is, is becoming a mandatory. Carrying that, isn't that true that social emotional learning is, is like becoming a mandate across New York State? So Carrie's nodding her head, but we, I'm going to ask her. Yes, you're right. <laughs> I unmuted <laughs> myself. <laughs> okay. So, so that's the theory behind it. But I, you know, as a, uh, I, I want to move into just what you're saying, Mitch. Well, so what? You know, okay, right. Good. So even more important for, for me, uh, Robin Ruiz has uh, raised – the importance of observing and modeling the behaviors, attitude, and emotional, emotional reactions of others. So I thought that was a really trenchant comment. It, it's a wonderful comment. And again, as we'll see that the, the idea of story is that, and I, I do it this way, is that first a kid can easily internalize these things. We can put all kinds of fancy charts up and we can talk to them and we can show them. But when they hear a story, they quickly internalize that message and begin to act on it as we've seen in terms of therapy. It, it, it impacts their vocabulary, it impacts their relationships, their behavior. And then we go and can easily inter integrate stories into curriculum. But then uh, out of the story, you build a project and it goes home. And this is where we were at before the doors to school closed. But I, I will say that just to, to see so out of story, Mitch, when you say it, it helps kids engage, it, it engage. A story is engaging. And it connects them with a voice inside themselves so they can begin to reflect on what their story is. And then it can be used to teach the social emotional skills. It builds community. It brings calm, which is going to be the theme that we're getting into. And then it helps him easily simply embed these things as opposed to having social emotional learning or character education or ethical or moral education be something separate 
by having stories in classroom and home settings, it, it raises these things. So, I mean, the other critical piece, as my, uh, may I assume that my sister who raised the question is Latina from her name, or is that uh, really stretching it? So I'm not sure. Uh, but Robin, if you want to unmute yourself, or yeah, I'm sorry. We use Blackboard Collaborate, but I love Zoom, um, and I forgot how to work it. Um, you no, know, my husband is Latino. I am American. <laughs> no, quite all right. <laughs> we were all a mixture. I know, um, but anyway. Um, what was the question you asked? You know, I just was reaching out because the next part of it is to make sure that a story touches the culturally responsive and responsible part. So we're sensitizing kids and others to our, uh, not just diversity, but how help build that sense of what some people call pluralism, but at least have the stories by sharing stories from different cultures and backgrounds. Not only are the kids internalizing uh, key lessons, but they're also somehow, Carrie, do you remember? I mean, I think one, some kids came up and go, gee, that sounds like a story that I've heard, or that tells a lesson, or parents will say, gee, that teaches a lesson the same as, as my culture teaches. And so it just builds that way. So I am been told that we can't play video, but you know, so here's one setting in one community where uh, we're, we're dealing, bringing stories in and dealing with special needs, what I call exceptional kids, not exceptional needs, but exceptional kids and how the stories help them connect. Uh, we find that stories work for everybody, but they especially provide a connection and a language for kids who don't fit in the box, who don't always feel that they are part of or the, that the education or even society is there for them. And suddenly you see that kids are really opening up and that's where the stories, so we can talk about social emotional learning we could talk about these things but the stories provide a simple way for these kids to reach that and so then we say it's also easy to take them home it's easy for them to go home and develop ways that that happens carrie you just experienced a situation as we started to move them home where you already got some feedback do you want to share that? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, with the abrupt closure of schools, um, we had had um, packets ready to go home. Well, actually to teach the kids during class, um, but we ended up sending them home with the students on our last day, which was last Monday. And um, when I called a parent just to check in, I talked to the student and his younger sister is also piloting the program in kindergarten. And they both were talking about how together they had read the story and were um, doing some of the activities that were in there together as a family because they were both there. So even though we've kind of transitioned to taking away the teacher led um, and discussing them in class, they're now bringing them home and parents are doing them. And I've been doing Zoom um, all this week with my students and slowly but surely I've gotten more and more um, students involved. And I have um, 19 out of 22 students have been there. And so tomorrow we're gonna be talking about Snappy. I told them all to get ready and we're gonna discuss how we can move forward doing Snappy every day on Zoom. So, And that is a wonderful segue for me to introduce my favorite friend. I'm, I, let me quickly show the, this chart. So when you say where stories fit in, so here again are the 
competencies, self-awareness, management, social awareness, relationship. And we just take, these are five out of some 20 odd stories that we have, and simply take our favorites uh, and put them in. And so let me introduce you to Snappy, <laughs> the turtle who couldn't keep his mouth shut. And if you don't mind. Is that like a direct um, dig at me? <laughs> oh, give me a break. <laughs> you know, we, I don't, Mitch told me that the volume wouldn't play. Ah. But, the turtle who couldn't keep his mouth shut. Snappy the Snapping Turtle was always snapping at anything or anyone who came near him. Even those who just happened to say good morning nearly got their heads bitten off. He was so angry that soon there was no one in the pond who would go near him. You might be grumpy too if you were always stuck in the mud. So everything then changed the day a pair of swans on their way home spotted the little pond where snappy lived and decided to drop in for a rest snappy had never seen anything so beautiful in his life it was hard for the pond residents to believe but snappy actually made friends with the swans he'd look forward to their visits and tales of lands far away with lots of green grass and plenty of water He'd long to see those places too, but he would keep the swans busy for hours asking questions. They would smile at each other and take turns patiently answering him. And Snap even thanked them at the end of the day. But then one year it didn't rain at all. And the pond began to dry up under the heat of the burning sun. Everyone in the area, both the people and animals, were starving. The birds were leaving to find a better home. The swans decided that it was time for them to leave as well. So they came to say a sad goodbye to their friend. Poor Snappy couldn't believe that they would leave him behind. The swans, too, wondered how they could save their friend. But everyone knew that turtles can't fly so snappy came up with an idea he told the swans to get a long stick my snappy jaws are strong enough that if you fly slowly you could hold the two ends and carry me along once i clamp down on something nothing escapes my grip but the swans were worried what do you think they were worried about what if Snappy couldn't control himself and opened his mouth? He would lose his grip and fall down. They made him promise not to open his mouth no matter what. Birds, they all flew off and higher and higher over hills, valleys, fields, and plains they went. Wow, I never thought I'd be able to see this these things thought Snappy, but no matter what, he kept his promise and held on tight. Again, birds would fly by and laugh, hey, a flying turtle. I'd never seen a turtle bird before, but the swans told their friend just to ignore them. They're just jealous. Don't pay any attention. Just keep your mouth shut and enjoy the ride. But then they flew over a city. The people of the city were amazed to see such a strange sight. They laughed and clapped their hands. Snappy tried his best to ignore them, but then someone shouted, Look at the swans carrying that silly turtle. Oh, that made Snappy angry. Why are you foolish people making such a racket? He snapped. Uh oh, he had forgotten his promise. He lost his grip on the stick. And down, down, down he fell to the ground because he just couldn't keep his mouth shut. Well, folks, this is a time of potential trauma for little kids. But they have made up such creative 
right, Carrie? They have made up such creative endings to the story. It's where Snappy fell. And the only thing that I, I have to prepare for the some of the little, little ones who will be very sensitive and just sort of in their meekest voice go, did he die? And And so depending on how things go, Snappy is one of the critical key characters, the, the protagonist in our stories. And what happens, this is what happens in school, and then we'll extend to what out of school. This is a poster which we, you know, simple that we provide. Anybody who finds the natural mistake in here uh, will win a prize, but nobody's been concentrated on it. And I'm not going to ask you today. But what we've done is create a series of sticks. And at the bottom of the sticks, there are a bunch of self-control strategies, be it meditation, mindful breathing, be it sit on your hands, uh, count 10, anything the kids want to do. And so they then, in, in guided things, the teacher will say, what are the kinds of emotions that make it hard, what are your triggers? What are the things that are hard for you to control? And they go and go through this whole process of putting them up and then they each take their sticks and fill them out. Like what are the strategies? Now, so, so there is a question from Debbie. Um, yeah. Actually, it, it kind of uh, where can, where could she find this story and also the activities related to this story um, to, to be able to use with her students, where could she find that? Is that on the uh, wisdomthinkers.org website? Well, right now we've just trans, we're just in the process of transferring from school base to home base. So if Debbie, I know Mitch will prominently display my email and my phone number at the end and Debbie or anybody else who's, who's interested can, connect with me, we'll figure out how to get you, get it to you. Some of them, uh, I'm trying to see whether that slides here, but for districts or teachers we work with, we create a login uh, on our website where you can go in and, and listen to the story or download the story, or we have an audio ebook of Snappy as well. So we're looking right now at uh, so by all means, connect, connect. Uh, so right now the issue is suddenly out of this whole process, as, as Carrie said, we were preparing for this next school year and doors shut. And so how does this go home? Well, suddenly we find that we're able to put a letter together, which we call De-Stress with Snappy. Take an emotional break. The teachers sent home with the package suggesting that here are a bunch of activities. And I don't, one thing about PowerPoint, I couldn't get it big enough, but basically we just listed the activities that everybody thought were transferable to a home environment and then sent it back. And so right now, uh, that's one simple way that we've we've done this and have the package and things ready uh, on on these sides which we can share but one cool thing that that we've always done to get this going is I always offer to come in to class right Carrie Dan and I always and and so how are we gonna do this well suddenly as Carrie said, Mitch said, Zoom shows up and there's my, the class of kids and Carrie can, Dan can just invite me. And as a matter of fact, Dan Johnson, who is, uh, works with these exceptional kids in Fulton, New York, Carrie's in Chittenango, New York, uh, actually invited me to come in this morning just to test this whole thing out. And Dan told me, Show the show my kids, and I'm going to let Dan just comment on this. Tell us what's going on, Dan. Okay. Um, hello. Uh, I had a little trouble getting in. I didn't. I don't. I didn't have a. Uh, 
our Chromebooks weren't able to get on with Zoom, so I was using my phone today a little bit, um, but we're working on it. So the picture that Ralph just showed is um, an example of us using Snappy for, um, we, we had read it last year, we had uh, touched on it the year before, but I've I have kids for two years for seventh and eighth grade in special education. And what we did was, since we were gonna do Snappy again during the beginning of this year, we did it, but we did it with a twist. We heard that some of the first and second graders at our largest elementary school were having trouble um, keeping their hands to themselves with self-control with a lot of different things. And so what we did was we learned the story and then we put it on as a play. So if you look at the picture Ralph has there, we very simply uh, put together a costume, which was a dragon costume that one of my teacher aides made me wear for uh, costume day and we turned the uh, dragon into a into a turtle had my student who doesn't like to read out loud but has excellent facial expressions he was the turtle and then all the different characters including the sun when it came out and dried up the mud and um, the swans that picked up the turtle and we even had a stick for the turtle to hang on to so um, some of the pictures that you'll see there uh, or at least that one picture is with the first grade class that we presented to. Our plans, whoa, <laughs> my battery's going dead. Um, luckily my real battery isn't going dead, but, um, but we, what we did was we, um, we were able to do this play for the first graders. They asked some wonderful questions. We took pictures afterwards and they loved it. So our plan was in the future, we were going to do another story, which is the boy who swallowed the sun we're going to do that for the entire first grade. So we start out with one class. We're going to go with the whole grade level. Um, it works out perfect transportation-wise because we swim on Fridays once a month over at this elementary school. And the principal there is a former teacher when I was principal. So I've got a great connection there. But the kids loved it. My students absolutely loved it. They were empowered. It's a higher level of thinking to have to teach something to someone else, but to do it in the manner of a play and everyone from the lowest reading level to the highest reading level was a part of it, either in stage direction, in different uh, characters and how they acted out their lines. Um, and then they watched, of course, uh, poor Snappy fall to his doom. But um, he was still around at the end and all of the little kids wanted their picture taken with our friend Jonathan, who was the uh, turtle for this. But the kids really enjoyed it. It's kind of our class picture now that that I uh, use to represent our class and it's something that they're doing it this week being home I feel like it's a it's a it's a feeling of comfort that they have that they can um, use snappy to um, you know read about him and do some of the activities that we haven't done yet we did our own activities on him but to do the activities that were developed by the program it's going to be outstanding to do that and to take pictures of their um their projects that they do or to act out the play with the puppets on video all kinds of things that they're really going to be excited about doing and they're like i said again they're eighth graders but they're uh, a little below average iqs and just wonderful kids and like like i wrote to them today they're my rock stars because they did so much um in putting together a play over a couple days and doing it for the younger kids who looked at them like they were heroes um, and just one more thing, uh, initially the principal said, oh, you want to go visit Lauren's class? Lauren's class was a special ed class uh, over in their building. I said, oh, no, we, we'd like to do this for um, regular ed, first grade or second grade class. Uh, and, and that's, you know, where we're coming from. That these kids, because we were working out of their wheelhouse, talking and acting and, and their expressions and everything, it really uh, was a positive reinforcer for them. And I think it was an eye opener for the staff of the building also um, that my students who we always tell are so capable of so many things were able to carry this. And, and like I said, hope if the school year went on, we would have done some plays for some bigger groups, but maybe we'll be able to do that online somehow. But uh, I also want to send a shout out to Carrie for thank, how, thank you for helping me get on Zoom. We did have one student this morning who is going to be a blogger someday and he's already writing things about Snappy that we're gonna have posted throughout the world. So what a great thing for that kid to say that he'll be on a blog um, that you know Ralph puts out and, and it'll go to all over the world. So he's a 12 year old, 13 year old boy and he's, he's really going places and it's exciting. So thank you for your help with, uh, 
with Zoom today. We're gonna we're gonna Zoom today. We're gonna Zoom tomorrow. <laughs> Great job, Dan. <laughs> so here's Mitch. You may have a comment, but I just want to say these kids walking into Dan's room, and Dan had a vision, which was how do we let kids who've been labeled, and in this case labeled special ed, but they could have been labeled. People can be labeled in any way. How can we let these kids who have been labeled understand that they too can go and change the story of the world? And that three years ago was our goal. And to be able to watch, and these are different kids as other kids have graduated, but the, it is sunk into this classroom culture that somebody else can label them what they want. Somebody else can give them a story, but that's not theirs. And here is such a dynamic enactment, real, not, not that these kids have grown. So Dan also touched on one critical point. The theme of this uh, talk today is how do we do it at home? Okay, so we're showing you stuff which happens just to give you a basis so you can understand and we are going to be experimenting over the next whatever period of time as long as we're staying in but i'm sure with the way education is going we're gonna there are gonna be some things which continue so i would invite any and everyone who have ideas uh beyond what we can handle today uh in discussion to you know, stay in touch and watch what's unfolding. Uh, so, so Ralph, there have been some questions uh, that have come up. So I just wanted to give sure, you let's know, just stop a chance to, to go through the questions. So um, Mrs. Uh, Kashif has, and I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, um, has brought up, uh, how, do you, how do you find stories? Um, that can be used for teaching and then how do you relate those how do you then figure out what those stories teach and one of the example that she brought up is the story of Amelia Jane by Enid Blyton um, where Enid, Amelia Jane is bullying the toys and the toys get together and they teach her a lesson and she gets better but you know stories like that how do you find stories like that okay so when I started this if you remember, one of my goals was to uh, deal with what Europe is, talks about. They use the, the very sterile term social cohesion. But really what it means is how do we all live together as fellow human beings? How do we all imagine, like John Lennon's song, that there are no boundaries? We each have our songs, we sing, we each have our our stories and how can we use stories as a way to come together and so my goal in choosing stories were twofold one is i've spent my whole life with this so it's you know i'm now 72 so probably since for 50 years i've been sitting at the feet of some of the greatest storytellers and spending time in different cultures all over the world so for me even though uh, I love young adult authors and children's books authors and everything. I wanted to go and take traditional stories, stories which have bound cultures together for 5,000, 6,000, 500,000 of years and taken individuals and cultures through uh, really horrible times. And so it wasn't hard, but I, I, what was hard was to take a criteria, which was first, I wanted stories which either had a child or an animal as the protagonist. So teachers, so kids could relate to it. And our now 13 year old granddaughter was three at the time, and she'd be playing on the family room uh, floor and we're all sitting together when they came out of the 
uh, when the rough cut came back from the studio and if she got up and walked out of the room I got on the phone and went back and said, that didn't work <laughs> if she sat there through it and even as a three-year-old would ask some questions okay that's a take that story worked the, the sound worked and everything so are there some stories then that work better for different groups of students like if you were teaching middle school um, are there stories that work better for middle school or if you were teaching kids that let's say had been suspended from their schools um, are there stories that work better for them or that work worse for them that you've in your experience well after 10 years and I, I'll let Carrie and Dan Carrie who's a first grade teacher and Dan who's a middle school and has been a middle school principal speak to it but if you how many of you have stories that you learned as a child at your grandparents' feet or around a holiday table that still inform you that you may pass on to your children or grandchildren, even though we're elders? Everybody is everybody pretty much on that page. Sure. And and so I wanted to take that idea. And so the stories don't change. What changes are the questions and the activities and what is demanded of the kids as they dig deeper into the stories and build their critical thinking skills or whatever becomes developmentally, what do you call it, uh, scope and sequence, Carrie? So as, as in, in terms of, but just developmentally appropriate activities, the story is timeless. And so, uh, well, oh, Carrie, haven't you said that some stories you, you may want to give a little, uh, there's some vocabulary words that you unpack a little bit before you get into the story? Right, I think for any grade level, the stories are appropriate across the board, whether you're in kindergarten or whether you're in eighth or ninth grade, because the moral concept is the same, right? Mm -hmm. Every kid, but there are, um, there's verbiage or words that the kids, especially in first grade, may not be, um, have the background knowledge or understand. So sometimes we look at it and kind of unpack the word first before we get into the story. Uh, this is Suzanne Gilmore. I've been working with the project and I think one of the very valuable things that all of these folks are doing are looking at ways so we can differentiate to meet the needs of all learners. So whether that's vocabulary, whether that's pacing, how we're, what pedagogy we're using. So they're doing a fabulous job trying to make this all work during this uh, very much time of transition. So they're doing a great job. Suzanne Gilmore is Dr. Suzanne Gilmore, former uh, chair of department at, at Lemoyne and, and developed the education and executive education leadership program at SUNY Oswego. And she's been kind to more or less sign on as the lead in our design team as we move forward. So Suzanne, personal thanks and much thanks for that comment. We have some real ringers in the in the room here. <laughs> so one of the things I'm hearing is that it's not just the story. The story is what's it's kind of a high bandwidth way of getting inside people's brains, kids' brains, or or even adults' brains. Uh, and then very often it's what you do after the story that really changes behavior. Is that mm -hmm. is that accurate? I, I agree with that. We <clears throat> so um, the, go ahead. Okay, just just to touch on real quick, um, some of these stories could be used with obviously kids in kindergarten. But when we did it with kids in eighth grade, we did a lot of text to self connections, which would be um, kind of intuitive. But we also did text to text connections, which when we took things from our um, we took things from <laughs> my phone's dying. Uh, when we took things from a story that's read in seventh grade, like A Long Walk to Water, which was about the running boys, or the, the boys in uh, Sudan. Um, we were able to relate that story to the Long Walk to Water, where we talked about who were the swans for the main character, Sanye. And so what they would, what we do is who helped him? Who were the swans? So we were taking characters and kind of relating it together, um, you know, why did he have to have self-control during the story? I mean, if he went and um, 
they, he, he, had, he was a leader of over uh, 3,000 uh, running boys in Sudan trying to get them to a camp in Ethiopia. And he had to have self-control not to eat all the food, to share it with everyone, to give it to the kids that were sick. Um, there was a lot of things where we were able to relate that. So I think the text to text connections are really, really important with this. Um, it really helps you take it throughout the year. And we also did some things with the outsiders um, where we really were able to connect um, being golden from other stories where people help people. Um, you know, what, you know, stay golden, Johnny boy from outsiders. We were able to relate that to um, one of the characters in, I always say it wrong, the greatest bargain. No. Real bargain. Real bargain. Real bargain. That wrong. So, Mitch, <laughs> to pick up on what you're saying, one thing about the story is that the kids immediately internalize the message, but we reinforce it through the activities, right? Through the discussion and activities. And right now, uh, you've seen some of the activities. And are, are we going to, when? what is our stop time? Well, so I have 12.58 as the time now. So, and we got started a little bit late because uh, we got hijacked. Uh, so why don't we think about, let's say, one, 105, 1010, sometime in that time frame. Okay, because I want to come to transitioning to the activities while we're talking about it from uh, paper digital activities where we can, uh, as I was invited in to Dan or Carrie wants to invite me in, but as you see, I can go in and tell stories, but the neat thing about this is that you've got a package of activities, you've got the audio files, which the kids can listen to on their own as, while they're home, and then uh, we're also exploring, and I'll, I'm going get, to get to a really new and exciting tool, which is an augmented reality program that kids can go in called 3D Bear, where kids can go in and create a digital environment and video that. So coming out of this, we know how to get the story to people. What we're experimenting with is how we get the activities, where the activities are posted, how the kids can share in, in ways. We've moved collaborative activities to individual activities. So anybody who has ideas on uh, once now the kids are in their separate place, they can post stuff. All that is something that's going to evolve. I just want to share two quick things. I don't know whether anybody's in an education environment where data is important. Anybody re need data? I think more, more and more it's everybody. Okay. So here, just to show you an impact, this was, Helen, are you there someplace? I don't know whether she's on or not, but she's one of my curriculum design and, and trainers who physically put this <laughs> took. There were yes, two. Yes, I am here. Do you want to speak to? Hello, Helen Bolin. Hello. Do you want to speak to how this came about? Oh no, you can go ahead and do that. I'm fine. All right. <laughs> so, we, before spring break in uh, last in 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 eighteen, we had a very simple pre, seven question pre, uh, given and then an assembly, in assembly the kids were read snappy and over the next two months only, the teachers went through some of the activities that we're using now. And you suddenly saw just in that two month period, an increase in moving from a baseline to almost always, just in a two month period, from 33% to 50% said they could control anger. Now, I'm not gonna read everything, but I don't let other students control what I do. And it's pretty remarkable. It was a group of, and I, I honestly, even though I, I know the stories have impact, I was skeptical that, you know, in a two month period, what are we gonna see? But whoops. 
but basically here you saw that impact on a decrease and say who said they could never control their anger that they never had a problem that that you saw this increase or decrease in the sense that they were better able to control their anger or whatever it was in those periods um, i'm just going to speak to one great project and then we'll talk a little bit about the 3d air thing this is uh I'm not supposed to be able to show movies, but maybe I can. Nathan, tell me about your sandbox. Can you hear that? Okay. What gave you the Well, it was from a story that we did. Mm -hmm. It was about how people, like, when something happens, like, if they're mad or something and, and like, mad at somebody, you can write their name in it and then shake it. Um, so it um, shows, like, give it away, like, stop it being nice, like it's in the past. That's really cool. Do you like that idea? Yeah. And so how does it work in the classroom? Like, um, if you come in from like recess or something, like, and somebody put accidentally like a question or something in your medical, you can just come in, write it, and shake it away. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. That's one of the neatest things I've ever heard. <laughs> Any other thoughts on what you would tell other kids about using the sandbox? Um, I'm not sure. You could. Uh, there's other things, not just people. Mm -hmm. Like if you, if you're like if you're like sad about something too, you can write what you're sad about and then just shake it away. Oh, that's super cool. Thanks so much. You know. I know who wrote that story. I've met them several times. Would you like to meet the person who wrote that story? Yeah. You just did. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what keeps me going. And the sandbox thing is something you can do at home if you don't want kids throwing sand all over. What are those called, Carrie? Magics? Uh, the, the, uh, the things that you used to have this sort of uh, transparent thing and you can do that or like an etch a sketch where kids etch. can do that and then shake it off and 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 so that's all these things you get a story and then everybody comes oh, i didn't tell them to do this the teachers and kids came up with it and it just spreads that way so now i'm gonna shut up and and mitch do you want to talk to 3d bear or should i hit this thing here and see if it comes up you can you could hit that that's uh that takes to the um to the url um it just it, it just seemed to me that 3d bear would be an interesting way well we, they, we've actually done this with kids where um where using augmented reality on a tablet or a cell phone the kids build a scene about some story and then they make a video about that story also and there's a page on 3d bear if you just go to if you did go to 3d bear um you know you you could either go to this url or you could um or you, you could just go to 3d bear.io and click on uh coronavirus um but you can download 3D Bear with your kids and, and have them act out the stories or act out themes based on the stories in augmented reality and then share them with other kids or with other classes. So I thought when, <laughs> you know, especially we'd been talking about this, but when this hit, I said, wow, would this be cool? So on one hand, <clears throat> we're expecting <laughs> to find a platform or a place on Wisdom Thinkers website to, to share what the kids are doing in terms of their activities. Uh, this is a self-contained thing where if they make a, a video or a story, they can, they can post that too. So I'm gonna just, uh, I guess, uh, and I just I just want to say that that's not the only way for kids to to be sharing and and uh, internalizing the story. I love the idea of those kids who created a play based on the story and used it with the younger kids. Um, that sandbox idea you know, came directly out of kids uh, creating stories and sharing those stories with other kids. Say in a Zoom uh, meeting is another way. Uh, uh, writing 
poems or writing, um, you know, uh, histories uh, based on a story, uh, you know, or other ways. But I just thought, you know, kids, kids like um, using technology, they like augmented reality, and this is one thing. And I, I love the the guys from um, 3D Bear. So I just, you know, I, I I think they came up with a really interesting application. Absolutely. I I'm I would love to hear in the remaining time from anybody else out there who's got some comments or ideas. Yeah, I'd be interested. In, you know, other people who have used stories, and I guess. Um, in the intervening time, the, the thing that was in my mind is we have a bunch of kids who are home who are wondering, like, you know, what's going to happen to me? Are, uh, are my, my, is my family going to get sick? Is, are people going, that I know going to die? And what, do you have, what stories, or is there a particular story that you would use to help those kids understand that this is part of life. You know, I'm gonna uh, <clears throat> take a, uh, a little while and anybody who wants that question answered, uh, I will dig into our repertoire and get a story out which can help. But our thought was, if we started with the idea that <clears throat> there is such strength within everybody as we started today, such light within everybody, and if just like that idea of putting your airline mask on first, if you then can hug your child close and tell them not to worry that there is there is always there are always storms in the world some much stronger than others but my goodness uh, you know where kids are living through wars and they're living through tornadoes and they're living through fires and this is not to uh, this is unprecedented that the whole world is being asked to sacrifice at the same time it is not unusual. I mean, you, you talk about uh, not just Americans, everybody in the world, when there's a disaster of some sort, everybody comes together. Compassion just sort of oozes out and everybody wants to take time to help the victims. But those are specific, geographically located victims of a disaster of some sort where everybody else can continue with their life and focus their attention on those in need. This is calling on us who are not, and I'm speaking for Americans now, we are not used to sacrifice on a daily basis. We are not used to the concept of suffering universally. This is not part of what our culture has taught us. And so as opposed to one story which we read, I want to see the story which all of you and all of us all over the world are able to kindle the light and cut through the darkness. I don't care. There are thousands of stories out there that I can share, but for me, the most important story, the most beautiful story is the story that is gonna come out of this crisis because always remember that darkness is there, but the darkness is just a background for the light to play upon. And the darker it becomes, the brighter you all are gonna shine. And the more you're gonna be able to give to your children and everybody around you. Can, I say, oh, yeah, can I say something? I just wanna say, especially with dealing with first graders and I've been talking to them all week, and what I have seen is that, and I know for myself personally, I like control. I'm used to being a planner, organized, uh, mm -hmm. structure, routine. That's part of being a teacher. And this, what I've had to learn through this crisis is that there's only so many things I can control, right? I'm, I can't control everything, but I can only control certain things. 
So to me, Snappy is a beautiful story to use, especially at this time, because what Snappy teaches us is about self-control. What can I control? And so these children can learn and discuss and share things that they are in control of. They can't control what's going on. They can't control that they're stuck at home or that they don't get to see their friends, but what can they control? They can control their reaction to it, their feelings about it. And so I think this story in particular is a great story, not to maybe talk about um, what they have to give up, but more about what they can control and what they have control of. And I think that gives them power. It, give, it helps them to feel strength in themselves. And so I think that we can use this story or other people can use this story for this purpose, what's going on right now. I think it's very applicable. Wow. Just my two cents. <laughs> wow. That was great. That's outstanding. And I then, have one too, Ralph. Oh, no, go ahead. Ralph knows my, one of my favorite stories is The Real Bargain um, because uh, I can't, no spoiler alerts, Ralph, but um, this young man is given a lot of money to invest and to, to buy and get the, a real bargain at a, um, at the big marketplace. And instead he uses it to help people he feeds people he um ends up buying clothes for some you know people that didn't have clothes and he went and he shopped he got the best bargain he came back to the um it's told much more eloquently by ralph but he comes back to the sorry about that he comes back to his father and he doesn't have anything with him just his servant with him and, and himself and his father is ready to hit him and he's really upset. And he says, they gave us their blessing. That was the greatest, that was the real bargain that they, they've got that and they have so many good things for them. And the, the father had to step back and say, I didn't want my, you know, my child to be a shrewd person trying to find the best buy and living for making himself more important than other people. Cause that comes up in the story too. But he, he really helped other people. And by not going to people's houses and by not going out and by understanding that they can use their control, uh, like Carrie was saying, I feel like, because um, this story really talks about him giving up himself and going against the grain with what other people are doing and helping other people, that there's so many ways we can check on people and help people without going to their house maybe or taking care of their lawn or something like that. So I really thought the real bargain would be a really good one for this also. Wow, that's a great, that's a great uh, thought. I also, as, as you were both talking and, and listening to Ralph earlier, something that Ralph said that I, um, I don't know that we all caught it when he said it, but just the idea that yes, we're living in dark times right now, but the darkness is just the, back, the background that lets our lights shine. And I think that's a very powerful statement, probably a good statement to end on even. Uh, because uh, Ralph, your light has shone on all of us and continues to, to shine on kids all over the world. So uh, thank you for appearing. And do you have any uh, closing thoughts for us? <laughs> I just wanna hear from everybody. Let's continue building this community of light and keep spreading it each in our own way because that's the cool thing it's not one story the one story is of the light that unites us but in that there's countless diversity everybody regardless of where they are what they look like what whatever transcends everything so i just want my only wish and hope is that this just continues to grow and spread. And I can't thank you enough, Mitch. And for everybody else who's taken their time today, please correspond and, and keep sharing. Well, thank you, Ralph. And this is uh, Mitch uh, from EdChat Interactive. Please join us in future events um, at our website, edchatinteractive.org. Uh, please get in touch with Ralph. I put his email into the, uh, the group chat, um, but... Um, yeah, but Ralph is a fountain of great ideas that we all need in these times. So I'm signing off and have a great rest of the day, everybody, and hope to see you online. Take care. Bye. Thank you.